All right, and we're back for another episode of the Lakers Fast Break Podcast. It's Gerald Glassford coming right back at you here from Lakers Fast Break, Pop Culture Cosmos, Inside Sports Fantasy Football, and Game Source. We truly appreciate everyone out there listening to all of our great shows. And if you can, please give us that five star review on Apple Podcasts. Plus, if you can like, share, subscribe, follow, or do anything you can to support us right here at the Lakers Fast Break or Lakerholics.com, it is truly appreciated. I just want to go ahead and thank everyone for their patience. I've been working on some other things outside of Podcast Rome, including the Indie Pods United Convention, which I will be hosting some seminars and obviously doing some live shows there as well. But I've come up with a creation that I'm entitling a look back at the Lakers 2020 season in the podcast form. So that'll be actually coming up to the Lakers Fast Break channel. It'll be part one covering the first part of the Lakers championship season, and that'll be coming up sort of reflective back of some of the great conversations I had in the early days of the Lakers Fast Break. So check out that coming up on Wednesday right here at, at the Lakers Fast Break channel. And I want to go ahead and send another special message because it's been a great weekend for many people out there. USC Trojans won. Yay, at the last second. Mass Effect got announced a new Legendary Edition, which I'm uber excited about, as you can tell by all the Mass Effect out there that you can see behind me. So I'm really excited for that. But as my good friend, the birthday boy himself, said on last week's show, good did triumph over evil. Well, it's going to be a great episode we have for you out there. I've also got the great Lakerholics crew with me today. We're going to be talking about a lot of good things for the Lakers coming up because there's so much to discuss with the basketball season right around the corner. And here today to talk about everything going on with the upcoming season and more, Drew Holiday, maybe trade target talk, the Lakers coming up as far as what are they going to do as far as the season's concerned because it's coming up right around the corner. First off, we're going to go ahead and talk about all the great things going on in the Lakers season with my good friend, He is the birthday boy, and we're going to spend the entire hour roasting him. you got to check out five great things that are going to be happening all over the place at Lakerholics.com. It is the birthday boy indeed. It is Mr. Jamie Sweet. And on behalf of everyone at Lakerholics.com and the Lakers Fast Break, a truly awesome happy birthday to you, my friend. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Well, you got an early birthday present on Saturday. I know. My quadratic birthdays are very stressful, man. My uh, my even numbered birthdays get a little stressful every every four years. So uh, I like the I like the fifteens, the seventeens, the nineteens. It's never any monumental uh, earth earth moving elections that decide the fate of uh, reality, uh, whether truth matters, things of that nature. But I will say there's more to talk about as far as decision makings because it should be decided on or finalized in the next couple of days. But it is looking more like it's going to be solidified that it is going to be a December 22nd start date. The players are being financially incentivized with a less percentage of an escrow and things of that nature that's being talked about. It's going to be a wild and woolly off season, very little off season to speak of as far as zero, (laughs) everything that's going to be jam packed in it. But I want to hear your thoughts. If the season does start and it looks like more and more, it's going to start December 22nd. How should the Lakers map out the season? I would say the first two months of the games counting ought to be treated like an extended trading camp. And by that, I mean, giving the vets specifically LeBron and hopefully Rondo time to just get ramped up in a way that doesn't, you know, that they, they start to build strength, start to build, you know, flexibility and, and, and just do it without risking injury. It has to be a risk, an injury risk managing season till, you know, if for some reason the playoffs are in jeopardy, which I don't anticipate, or a specific seating in the playoffs is in jeopardy, which could happen, I think you just have to try to. In some ways, it's one of the reasons I'm in favor of holding on to certain players and not others to kind of see if, like, an extended training camp when the games do matter helps them get a little more mojo going or gives them just the more of a chance to shine than they normally would when LeBron's in there. But we'll get into that later. Absolutely, we'll get into that later. There's uh, a lot to discuss when it comes to that, but here today as well to talk about a lot of great things that are going on with the Lakers season is a good man indeed. 
You know him as the Magic Man, performing some magic out there at Lakerholics.com. It is Sean Grice. And Sean, I want to go ahead and thank you for being part of the show as always. But how should the Lakers map out their season starting on December 22nd? Well, you know, Gerald, LeBron did say he'd be cherry picking. So we we kind of got an idea of where he's going with this. Well, first half he of got the, the year. suggestion from Obama to go ahead and do some cherry picking. So, you know, it's going to be a. I, go ahead. One name that hasn't been brought up is uh, Magic Mike himself. That's uh, LeBron's personal trainer that he's had since uh, his days with Cleveland. Mike is more important now than ever for Lakers fans. And if you're not familiar with them, get familiar with them because during this little truncated season, he's going to be more important than ever with LeBron's preparation. I mean, it's more of a mental preparation, I think, now with LeBron. I think his body can handle the grind. I think it's a mental preoccupation he has to have with how he's going to handle his minutes. I'd like him to play under 40 throughout the first half. I mean, in most games, if he can, if we can get him to like 33, 35, I think that's a win well, for he his didn't development average 30, this season. He didn't average 40 minutes during the course of the season. He averaged only, I think, about 36, 37, if I'm not mistaken. So if we can get well, him to 32, I would be ecstatic. And and the fact is, I will say this. I mean, I had spoken with Laker Tom, who's coming up here in a second as well. And one of the things that we talked about and discussed is how the Lakers map out last season. And I thought they would do the things that they're going to most likely be doing this season. And that is give AD and LeBron certain breaks, maybe have them sit out a game or two here or there because the schedule is going to be pretty brutal doing a lot of back-to-backs. And I'm going to tell you right now, that is going to be something a lot of people have to look at as far as saying, you know what, if you think they should go for number one in the West, you're really kidding yourself because the fact is pushing LeBron at this point in time, even though he started training already, like you said, it would be a great concern for the team if you go ahead and push him too fast too soon. Absolutely. I mean, the, the key right now is to limit his his stress minutes as much as possible. That, you know, him and AD benefited last year, right? They they both played the least amount of minutes they have in the playoffs. I think both of them averaged less than 37, I believe. So they're coming into this season not as washed as people may think as far as physical is concerned. I think it's more of a mental grind this time around. Ah, uh, good thing. Thank you, Jamie. 34.6 minutes per game last year. So I was almost on my, I actually had him over. So if he can cut that down to 30 to 32, I would be ecstatic. But yep. I, I agree with you on that. They need to go ahead and do something to make sure that he's set for the playoffs and fresher for the playoffs than he is at the start of the season. I'm looking more towards the back end instead of the front end of the season. And I, again, I don't expect the Lakers to be number one in the West. If you are, out there, I think you're crazy because that means just the Lakers are pushing too hard too soon, in my opinion. But who knows? Laker Tom might disagree with me on that. But again, he's the mastermind of what you're talking about when it concerns the Lakerholics.com site. You got to go ahead and be a part of the conversation today at Lakerholics.com. And the mastermind behind it is none other than Laker Tom. And the man who thinks Jared Dudley is a vital piece of the organization that needs to return which had me scratching my head all week long but laker tom getting to a more serious subject i want to ask you this i hope you weren't serious when you said that but i was serious oh my gosh we need to have your medicine check but i will say he'll be on the roster you wait and see well i didn't you know him on the roster is one thing him being considered a you must bring him back in integral piece of the organization. 15th is player. Another. He's the greatest fifteenth player in the league. <laughs> There's something to be said for that. I agree with that. Well, with uh, COVID before, protocols. No, listen, before before I even answer your first question, Gerald. Okay. I heard an interview today. Uh, it was actually from a couple of days ago, where Eddie Johnson was interviewing uh, 
Jared and, and at talking to him about the Lakers and whether he's coming back and so forth. And uh, he made a he made a terrific case for how valuable he is in the locker room. Of course he is. If you're going and, to be paid a million dollars to sit the locker guy, room. The 15th guy never plays. But the contributions that, that Dudley makes in the training room, in the meetings that they have, in the huddles, in talking to the players as being a mentor and a guide to the players, of keeping everybody in the same direction. You know, all of you people who are so much in favor of bringing the team back shouldn't be discounting the value that Jared brings to the lineup you know and why? the value that he brings to the team. Well, you know why uh, I'm discounting it? On one important reason, COVID. Because you got to remember, there actually is going to be a lot of changes. People are going to be getting sick at this. It's no longer in a bubble, my friend. Well, That's- the, the Lakers are a responsible organization, unlike the Dodgers. Uh, <laughs> well, I'm just telling you, you that nine odds, players test positive the day after they win the World Series. The odds uh, are not true. the odds are not in our favor. Okay, we're talking about playing against other teams. They're not all on the bubble. They go home to their families. What you know, whatever you want to say, it's not. Put going your money to be, down. Put your money down, Jared. Put my money so down. Have, First of all, I got no money to put down. But second of all, if I did, I would put it on at least some type of outbreak going on with one NBA team during the course of the season. Well, of course there will be. Uh, and if that's we're the case. At, we're already at 130,000 people a day. Yeah, even... so the odds are not in your favor, especially the fact that it's not going to be in a bubble environment. That's You're discounting why... the value of a player who's almost like a coach on the on the bench. I'm also discounting a player who also, if you might have to go to more often this year than you did in the previous year, just because of the fact that there might not be players available. You may have a situation where you that's have two, you three people. players to bring in. Ugh, that's, I, just wait and see. Jared Dudley will be on the Lakers roster. I don't say he won't be on the let Lakers me, roster. Let me get back to your original question. Okay, yeah. What, what, so what are we going to do as far as mapping out the rest of the season? Um... <laughs> I, I pretty much agree with what you're saying, but I think that there's a factor in here that's that's kind of interesting, and I think it could change the whole complexion of how teams look at the regular season. And that's the the sort of MLB series that we're going to be running against teams. You know, when we play Portland, we're going to go to Portland, uh, and we're going to we're going to play three four games against Portland. You're going to see a little series where you got three or four teams come in into an area, and you're going to see the same teams over and over. I feel sorry uh, for the teams coming in L.A. because I'll have to play the Lakers and the Clippers back-to-back, and they may do a, a, a couple of road trip for yeah, it? two, three, you four games. There, you can go in there and lose six or seven games real quickly. Yes. Uh, but the, but I think what's interesting about that is it, uh, it's like a mini version of the playoffs, if you will, because you get to do some strategizing. You get to adjust your lineups according to who those teams are and how we match up against them. Guys like Rondo all of a sudden become a lot more valuable than he is in normally in a regular season because he's able to to figure things out. And also, I think it gives you an opportunity to to find places, more places to rest certain players. There may be certain series where we don't teams where we play in teams that we don't really need to have LeBron and AD play big minutes. The Hornets come into town. Hey, it's vacation time. You know, uh, <laughs> the Cavaliers come into town. It's a break. This is load management, man. Don't tell that to Zion. Um, save them, save them for when, <laughs> when you have to play the Crosstown Clippers or you have to play the, the Blazers or you have to play the Heat coming into town. So I, I think you'll see a lot of load management that is series-oriented as we go into this sort of ironic new season. And then also 72 games, man. I mean, I know it's a, it's a catch-up to try to get all of the regular season – scheduling and and just to get back to normalcy if you will um and then apparently there's going to be some fans in the stands um at least in the in the uh luxury suites um so there's you know we're going to see some changes and, and it's it's another version of normal you got to remember also that there are advantages that the lakers have first off chemistry chemistry is going to be important and despite even the more radical trades that I might propose or that might be proposed on other sites, you're still going to have a core of seven, eight, nine players that, that returned from last year who have good chemistry. And you've got a culture that's been established by Frank Vogel and his coaching staff of defense first. And that mentality is going to be maintained through whatever moves that, that uh, Rob Palenka makes. 
Uh, and then you're the champions. And there's a confidence that every other player on that team, besides LeBron and AD, and even AD has gathered from becoming a champion and what that means. And finally and last, they're going to be playing some games at home. And <laughs> Staples Center, even if it's not, even if it's just the luxury suites and the family and, and friends in the stands, it's playing at home. And there's an, there's an advantage there that the Lakers are going to get. It's going to be more of like a regular season than the bubble. And I think in the end, all of that shuffles off to the best team in the league coming off of the best championship they've ever had and playing in a season where they know that they have an opportunity now to repeat. They're not going to blow that opportunity. I do believe they will finish number one in the West, not because they're going all out and wearing out their team, but because they are the better team. I will bet you Jamie Sweet's birthday money that (laughs) there will be some type of issue with the Lakers and COVID during the course of the season. Well, I'm not going to take that bet because it's logical that they're going well, to be. what you just Every were saying a minute ago that you all have to play. They'll play some team where some player gets COVID. You can't, you can't even call that house money. I think, what, is, what, do, you, what do you call that? Is that? That's like highway robbery. And then, <laughs> that's like saying, I'll I'll bet you, cents, I'll well, bet you said you. that there wasn't going to be an issue. You said it's the I Lakers. There's not going to be an issue. This guy in Vegas? Does this guy really live in Vegas? I, live I, in, I make sure. <laughs> I live in Vegas. I'm like the hotels. I make sure that the casinos, that right. I make sure that the money you're like is the hotels, on my they side. Don't gamble. They take the gambler's money. Hey. Well, you're not going to take my money in that Las sense. Vegas wasn't built on losers, baby. <laughs> you want to bet with me, Gerald, you got to put up cash. Uh, like I said, Jamie Sweet's, Jamie Sweet's birthday money is right there. <laughs> Hard cash. There you go. It hasn't, it hasn't been deposited yet. There you it's, go. It's like, it's like 50 whole dollars, I think. So, Jamie, I want to ask you this. Okay, we heard yeah. the issues, and, and obviously, we'll, you know, like your Tom and I can go on the importance of Jared Dudley, but I, the thing is, it, rosters may expand. There may be something like taxi squads or uh, some you know players from the G League that they might have. It's like two, three extra slots. No, I am the brute squad. Well, I haven't heard. I haven't heard that. Have you heard that actually, Gerald? That's a rumor that's going around. That's a possibility it's, because I have not heard it. Because you got to yeah. remember, this is not the NFL where you have fifty to sixty players right there for you. And no, but you only got five on the floor at a time. You know, it's not like yeah. But if you get four players out, like for instance, San Francisco had four players. They're put on the COVID list. They've got 45-plus players they can go ahead and replace them with. You don't have 45 players on a basketball team. So that's something that they might, they're they going to be considering. It's been talked about. Well, you got three times as many players as you need to put in the game at one point in time. But if you have three or four NBA players and you still want to play you know, on a certain right. team and you still want to go ahead and play the game, Right. So you don't think Dudley will make it even if we have twenty players? Huh? I just, th- <laughs> I just think again, you Jared Dudley will probably. Ma- I'm gonna. I'm not telling you Jared Dudley's not gonna make the team or not. I'm saying I think uh-huh. he probably will because you know people have that nostalgia feeling. Okay, bring back the entire team, even if you had a piece that just really couldn't give you more than five ten minutes of decent play. <laughs> I will once, just, a month. Once, a month, once a month. Once a month. I'm once saying, a month. I'm saying, can you use that slot? Or something that could mm-hmm. actually That's give enough. you a better co- contribution. You know, if you check Jared Dudley's stats for the season, you'll see that he shot very well. He, he did. played very well. He had an excellent net rating and he had an excellent defensive rating. Then why he didn't, didn't he play more? The then tell he didn't me play honestly, that. why didn't why um, did he play more? But Tom, this is the better question. I think it's not so much how did Gerald Dudley play, but in the future, using a schedule like you're talking about, like more of like an MLB sort of like mm-hmm. you know, like the Grateful Dead schedule, like hey, we're coming to this town, we're rocking out for a couple of days, and then we're heading off, right? Like it's a, it's the the ship has landed and hanging out for a little while. Right. Do you think it would be better? And I'm, and maybe it's the the answer is both. Maybe it would be better to have both a Jared Dudley and. Uh, like uh, a Costas on Tanakupo or a Kaycock, or wouldn't those minutes be better spent on those players to see what they can bring? And they're going to be, uh, they're going to be a little cheaper. Uh, I think, cause even though Dud's probably going to sign for the vet minimum, his vet minimum is going to be higher than their, not making anything rookie scale salary. The yeah, but they might... still, for the salary cap, they still consider those all the same. They don't consider two way deals all the same, so it'd be no, interesting. They, they consider the other. So no, yeah, be... listen, I, I understand what you're saying, Jamie, but I don't see the 15th player on the team. There's a there's a 
are you going to play or how do you affect the team in practice and everything else? I just think there's a great importance. There's a, gr- there's a great importance this year for a 15th man than in all previous years, just because of the fact and, that and if you're frankly, going to do I this. Think, I, I think that probably the minutes, even if he plays as well as he played last year, he's still the best 15th man in the league. Uh, I mean, uh, I'll tell you. Uh, you, go get the stats, you go get the stats for who is a 15th man on three or four teams and take a look at it. And Dudley's stats are excellent. And his contribution is undeniable for the chemistry and culture of the team. All right, I'm gonna. I'm gonna, I'm gonna put in Sean here real quick. Okay, Sean, you need to be the <laughs> you need to be the deal breaker between between us. Uh, hold on, Tom. You're on mute right now. But go ahead, Magic Man. I want to hear your thoughts on this. Okay, go ahead. I wanted to get because he hadn't had a chance to talk. Your thoughts on the Jared Dudley debate? Is he the best fifteenth man in the NBA? No, he's not the fifteenth best man in the NBA. Not by a long shot. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> there you go. Okay, hold on, hold on. Let me go get. Okay, go ahead, Tom. Go no, well, ahead. that's the obvious answer. Who? Where's the? Then give me some evidence. Who is the better fifteenth man on the lineup? Name okay. one. I like. I, I did have to go look at. I'm all trying. The I'm trying to look up. On, on, I'm looking at Google right now. Who's the best fifteenth man in the NBA? Bull Bull would be a top better option. Bull Bull, Bull Bull would be better. Yes. No, there's Troy uh, Daniels would... would be a better option, and he was the fifteenth man on in. So, yeah. Okay. No, I mean, and he no, played not... ahead of Jared Dunley on LA. So let's start there. Not by much. Not by much. But he is a better. He's younger. Well, never mind. Like I said, needless to say, I'm going to go ahead and continue the conversation because this could be a whole Jared Dudley hour here. But, we don't need that. Yes, we, don't need that. we don't need that. But I will say I'll put that. Some facts together for you. Yeah, well, and then I'll go ahead and I throw those will. facts away and throw it in you know, somewhere else. But I will tell you this. <laughs> Yeah, you know, analytics do. Oh, man, I swear. Uh, I, analytics are only so good. The guy for... from Vegas, you'd think that the guy would, would be looking at stats and would take numbers. I see. I do the eye test. Evidence. It's not just the numbers. Even it's the it's eye the test. Even though it's would make Duds the best 15th man in the league. Jared Dudley comes an article on, the, on that. Jared Dudley's – Just for you. Jared I'll, Dudley I'll, comes on the floor. You do not feel like you're going to defend your champion. the man in the NBA? Uh, okay, you, you can. Oh, hold on. I'm, I'm gonna. I'm now. I'm gonna start looking around to see just who I think. All right. Well, I'll I, don't tell you what... I, I don't have an answer. I'm not opposed to Jerry Dudley coming back on the team. Well, I, I, I didn't say rather... he wasn't gonna come back to the team. Never at any time, yeah. to, because you know it's all that warm, fuzzy, good feeling. We won the championship. Nostalgia. Woo! Of course, we bring I everybody back. Alex Caruso, people. But I will. Well, he's under contract, so you have to trade Alex Crusoe. I yeah. think he's untradeable. Uh, I think for the amount of money that he makes, two point seven million, there's not another player whose impact he'll bring back. Just do you have? I think a he's lot so of... good that he's probably become our second best trade ship. Okay. Again, whatever you bring back is not going to be equal to what you're shipping out based on cost. Like, well, that means you're, not, cost, you're, you're, not, you're not, you're not, you're not trading trading. for another two point seven million dollar player. You're likely including him in a trade for somebody who makes over twenty million, which means right. for the price of three players, you're only getting one. Uh, and so that's, I think, bad math. We saw how that math worked poorly in the NBA playoffs and NBA finals last year, and I don't see why would we get away from this math. Three is greater than one in the NBA, especially in the playoffs. Like, it's just. It's the, there's no denying it. Like I'm not. Holiday isn't a great team. Uh, uh, the true Holiday isn't a great player, but yeah. Well, that's coming uh, up next. We'll deal with that no, in a second. But but, but Sean, anyway. I know you wanted to say something because you know we've been on this argument for a little while now. But go ahead, Sean. Finish up so we can get on to another subject because uh, I've, you've been truly patient. And I really appreciate. It. Thank you, Gerald. And by the way, I do have a retort for Lake Tom, who's the better fifteenth man. I would submit. Vincent Carter. I'll take Vince Carter over Jared Dudley any day of the week and 10 times on Saturday. Okay. You know, that's, that's see, even Laker Tom shaking his head. There you go. This is Raphael from NBA draft junkies.com. And you are listening to the Lakers fast break. Check out what's been going on with the pop culture Cosmo show and the PCC multiverse. I see the potential for basically like another Netflix kind of paradigm shift where 
Here comes this other major player. They have a ton of resources. Apple could change the way that entertainment is consumed. They say it's the only time this year that you'll have stars from each brand battling each other. And we know it's not going to be the case, but they like to say that and more power to them, I guess. Well, it's a big first step bringing all those superheroes together. There were definitely some parts of the movie that I that I really enjoyed. And then there were some parts that I thought just kind of fell short of expectation. Part of it has to be something to do with how it's being promoted. And this is a thing where audiences do not agree with critics. That's the Pop Culture Cosmo Show. And the PCC Multiverse, every week on Apple Podcasts. And over a dozen of your favorite streaming and podcasting options. I will say this, you know, it's going to be something very interesting to see going forward. Yes. Do I think Jared Dudley's coming back? Most likely. It's just going to be something, like I said, the nostalgia and all that. But (laughs) again, it is something the Lakers have to make a lot of decisions within a short period of time, but also map out their entire season because it's looking more and more like December 22nd is going to be a go for the NBA season. So we're going to go ahead and keep you updated on that. But I don't think the Lakers, again, will be able to go ahead and map this out correctly as far as early on. It's going to be a little bit rough because you're going to have to give LeBron and AD some time off. And so there will be a couple bumps in the road. And if you think they're going to be number one in the West, maybe they will come back and be number one in the West. I'm just saying they shouldn't push for it because when it comes right down to it, as we saw the run by Miami, it doesn't matter where you end the season at. Just get in. Just all you have to do is get in. That's the thing. That's the, difference. Bubble, the bubble is the only reason that Miami made it all the way. Oh, but they it, won't make it next year. If they're going to Watch be playing in empty arenas in front of no crowd. I could see the NBA Finals being in front of more of a crowd. Kind of like how they did baseball, where you might even find an open air arena. It'll be close to summer. You could play at like the Coliseum or uh, somewhere that's got a retractable roof. Um, and that I think is a, a better option. I don't know if that was really an option this year because it was everything happened so quickly and there yeah. were so few answers medically. Uh, but I think by the time we roll around the next summer, a hopefully the situation six, will yeah, be six six, months, so, so yes, hopefully the situation in theory will be more under control. Potentially there will be a vaccine making its way through the populace of planet Earth, and uh, you know we'll we'll see how that all works out. But I think exactly. But I mean, I think one way or another, if if I were the NBA, I would start exploring that option. Like, what's the number of people we can fit? Like in Soldier Field in Chicago, which has a, a ridiculous number of. You know, you could fit a ton of people in there uh, and still socially distance it out and make it, you know. Even downsize the Coliseum, like you said, still seats 80,000 people. It doesn't totally. seat the 100,000 anymore because USC walled some stuff off. They had, but... they had to retrofit it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, but it's still 80. The new, new arena, I mean, the new sports stadium in L.A., there yep, you go. the soccer stadium. Yep. Now, there's a lot of options. Well, I, it'll be somewhere in the middle of the country, so that, or if not, East Las Coast. Las Vegas, cause, here. Cause we've got, time we've got a you've brand got, new... You've got a good point, too, Jamie, about the uh, vaccine, because I could see very easily that the players, if they vaccinate the players, they could avoid a lot of the interruptions that the MLB and the NFL have been struggling with. At, right at least to the schedule, yes. The schedule yeah. would have, have a more you can, wholesome... You could maybe it, keep yes. people... And that would, limit it, that would also minimize the number of quote, 18th, 19th, 20th, and 30th players that Gerald wants to have every team <laughs> Well, okay, you know what? It is going to be reality, my friend, because... Let's let's argue it, about that when we know yeah, what's coming. It's reality. What's, what's, you, you know, so, when yeah. you see the COVID cases during the NBA season line up, you're going to say, you know what, Gerald, you were right. There is going they to be... They will early on, I think. I would yes. think they will early on. I think there will be some cases winter. early on, but if they have vaccinations, if they, can, if they have a vaccine, they can really... They can really put a clamp on that. I do uh, have a comment made by Joe Randazzo, who is, uh, I don't think he's a Lakers fan per se, because he says he doesn't understand you people, meaning us, are trying to say <laughs> the Lakers had a great championship. They barely beat Miami in Miami. Do not have the, the Miami did not have their two starters. You know, the usual excuses that people made. Lakers, yeah. win. it's the greatest no. championship run ever because of the right. circumstances that were laid out in front of them. All the highs, all the lows. I don't want to go in detail, Joe, but I'm just going to say this. You know what? It was the best Lakers championship ever. It was the greatest NBA championship ever. Simple as that. The things that all these players had to go through for months from a mental standpoint that they don't want to go through again. None of them want to go through a bubble again. There's a reason why. And with all the highs and lows with Kobe's death, the issues in China, 
the fact that the Lakers were stuck in China, the, yeah. and the fact that they had their dominance over not one, but two of the best NBA teams in the Clippers and the Bucks during the course of the season, they showed their dominance back-to-back. And then not only top of that, they dominated four games to one in three series in a row, and then, of course, took care of Miami in six. You can say that Miami had its injuries, yeah, but even healthy, the Lakers would have taken care of them. It's obvious. Okay, the Lakers were the better team. The Lakers were the better team. People, non-Lakers fans just have to deal with it. They're making all excuses and trying to throw out asterisks. Unfortunately, the reality is that the Lakers played better than anyone else in this format. Deal with it. That's right. Deal with it. All all, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Simple as that. I mean, I'm so tired of hearing all this whining. It just look, the eyes have it. I mean, if Miami would have won, every we, you know, I would have told told you what you want. The Miami won. They, they, right, no. yeah. Simple as that. Okay. Some of us know how to concede if we didn't don't win. Yeah, well, and, and and to blame the injuries is is completely ludicrous because it gives a disservice to Jimmy Butler. It gives a disservice to the players on the Lakers that didn't even enter the bubble. You know, there's a lot of things. That it, it, it's frankly, it's a disservice. Every series has well, it. It's, you know, it, you're, you're saying like you have a coach that played seven guys. Like that, that's not on. The, you know, he could have had a bigger roster on those nights. Like, but I will thank Joe Rondazzo for watching. So I do truly appreciate watching and your comments. So if you do have any more comments, you're welcome to go ahead and send it to us at Lakers Fast Break on Twitter or Lakers Fast Break at Yahoo.com. Or you probably are in love with us already because of the fact that the Lakers won the world championship and now are the world champions. Uh, girls, we're, 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 we're so charming about it. Yeah, I mean, but again, I do appreciate you watching. Heading on. Lakers and I agree to disagree all the time. Yes, we argue every <laughs> single episode when we're all together. Yeah. I actually have. I don't agree with any of these guys. I have a ton <laughs> of great interviews that are one to one, which are very much a, a thing that you need to look forward to, especially when you're covering the uh, rest of the NBA and the NBA draft and NBA free agency. So look for that coming up on the road as well. If you don't like us arguing about the Lakers all the time, but I want to go ahead and talk to you guys before we go ahead more arguing on the Lakers all the time. Is about an upcoming trade target. And Laker Tom, in some of his crazy trades, did have some trade targets in mind. And obviously one of them is the hottest individual out there. It's Drew Holiday, which rumors have it say that Drew is the number one prospect that you can go ahead and get out there. But again, there's a lot of teams out there that are going to bid for his services. Right, Sean? Yeah, absolutely, Gerald. I would say right now, if you were to pin this down simply, I think Denver would have the best offer for Drew. I think Brooklyn has the best player for New Orleans. I think a couple other teams have some interesting pieces or draft picks that could sway Griff. But as far as the Lakers go, I think we're a little down on the total pole as far as trade partners here. I think so, just because of the fact that they don't want to do business with the same team twice. But there are other trade targets out there. Jamie, I want to go ahead and bring this in with you. I mean, Drew Holiday would be a great piece, but it doesn't look like the Lakers are going to be able to get him. Well, I mean, I don't know if it's out of the realm of possibility, but I will say that of all the over $20 million a year guards out there that have been tossed around, Drew Holiday is at the top of my list. Uh, I think... He makes a far better fit on the Lakers than Chris Paul. Chris Paul is a ball dominant guard. We have a ball dominant three. Uh, we don't need to like turn Chris Paul into a forty billion dollar version of Steve Nash in, in his one year with Kobe. Uh, what about just Oladipo? Became... I I would I feel like an Oladipo trade is you need to see him play. You, you just need to see him play. I don't care if he passes a medical exam. You know Isaiah Thomas passed a lot of medical exams and injuries that are serious like that, you know, quiet Matt Leonard still is managing his quad injury, you know, years later. So I'm hesitant to commit a lot to Oladipo. I would just assume him prove himself and become an unrestricted free agent the following year. Maybe he's like a guy number two. If we strike out on Giannis, I think that that is a smarter, smarter play. I don't think you need Oladipo this year to win. I don't think he like takes so much away from, what Danny Green could do, or Danny Green and KCP could do. Yeah, you know, I, that's I guess my issue is that I get I, I understand that there are quote unquote singular players out there with a lot of talent, but the cost that it's going to acquire to 
take to acquire them is oftentimes I don't see the return as being worth it. I mean, Tom, I think even the trade that you proposed for Drew Holiday, Neta Duro wins 15 more wins than us. That's why I'm kind of like, I don't know. Why are we making this try? Why are we throwing 15 wins away? Uh, not specifically against one team, but I don't know. That's just my take on it. It's it's. There's a lot of ways to look at it. I feel like the Lakers are going to go all in on the Giannis sweepstakes. Uh, I know that there's a strong movement, maybe not to, that you could get a guy like Drew or another superstar player. But you want somebody who's younger uh, than the 30 into the 35-year-old range, and that's, that's Giannis. He's going to be the best player in the NBA for 10 years. Uh, he and AD are going to vie back and forth for MVPs and defensive players of the year. Uh, and they might as well do it on the same team. I mean, if you could strike up a deal, Tom, <laughs> when it comes to Drew Holiday, I would actually go at New Orleans. I think that's just too, you could, they're going to ask for too high price. If you're going to go back to New Orleans, I don't think that's the player you should go for. I think it should be JJ Redick. Actually, he's on one of my lists also. I actually have two articles I'm writing. One is the, the four moves the Lakers could realistically make to be repeat as champions, and then the four moves that they could magically make. Um, J.J. Redick is the fourth on the realistic moves because it's outside shooting. Yeah. But there's, there's one New Orleans Pelicans player that I want to talk, to, talk about the most, and that's something that you said recently on Lakerholics.com, and you got to be part of this conversation out there because there's a lot of conversation going along. Sometimes the comments are longer than the articles themselves at Lakerholics.com that I notice. I try to stay out of it as best I can, but sometimes I just get sucked right in. So if you want to be part of that conversation, because there's quite a bit, including a lot of people like the comments we just had today, you got to go ahead and check out at Lakerholics.com. But that is something that you said, Tom, in regards to your fascination with a certain Lonzo Ball. And I'm trying to understand it because you said you would love to have Lonzo Ball back on the lake. I would. So, okay, I wanted you to go ahead and elaborate. While I roll my eyes for the next five to seven minutes, I want you to go (laughs) ahead and elaborate more on why Lonzo Ball is such a fascinating player to you. Well, I think I think there's a lot of reasons there. Number one is that he's an elite playmaker and he's an elite defender, and that's a combination that that is exactly what. You, and, he, and he also is a guy who doesn't need the ball. And those are three things that's really key when you want to build around LeBron James and Anthony Davis. He shot over 37 percent from three last year. He still has serious problems with his free throw shooting. He's become a better finisher, but not a great finisher. But the kid is only 22 years old. Have a great. He's petrified of taking it to the basket. Do you not remember? He's got related to the free throw shooting. He's got PTSD from the time Alex Caruso Mm. destroyed him going to the basket, and you see on all the highlights. You have to balance some things out there. You know, every every player that you're looking at that you might want to have on the team. Obviously, the the caveat is for how much. What do you have to give him? What do you have to pay him? Lonzo Ball definitely is a player who would fit on a LeBron James team and would fit on the Lakers very, very well. He's a guy who's great at throwing the ball ahead. He's a great fast break for a team that wants to run and score in transition. He is ideal. He's perfect for that situation. For a guy, if you want somebody who can be a lockdown defender, who's athletic and quick, he's a great defender. As a playmaker, he's in the he's in the same caliber as a young Rondo was. Um, so there's a lot of things that any any can shoot the three, and there's a lot of things that you can you can take that those are things that are going to be very very critical components when you put together role players. He's a role player. He's not going to be a superstar like his dad was hoping, but he's going to be an elite role player. He's the kind of guy that eventually could be a Robert Ory. Um, you know, somebody like that on a team. Um, He'll probably end up being that on the Pelicans because I don't think that they're going to give up on him. But there's a point in time in the future where there may be an opportunity for the Lakers to get him. Um, And he's, he's not, you know, I, I really, I really cringe and react very aggressively when people, when people, make what I consider to be unintelligent, biased comments against a certain player because of his father. And that really pisses me off, to be honest, Uh, because Lonzo Ball is an outstanding basketball player. He's going to get better and better. He's still extremely young. 
and he has great potential. He's going to be a force in this league for a long time. Well, there you go. There you have it. I personally don't agree. I think he's petrified. I think his shooting is always going to be shaky and streaky. I think you're going to have to go ahead and deal with that. He is a great off-the-ball defender, but on the ball, he's not quite as good. So you have to go ahead and, and come to grips with that. He's really good off the ball, but you know, I think defensively, I'm not sure exactly – when you're talking about New Orleans, who was a He's got a great player. defensive RPM. He's in the top 10 among guards in RPM. Really? Because RPM. New Orleans overall was a very pathetically bad team defensively. So I don't know how much of that is acquitted to him or not. So attributed to him or not. But, you know, I'll let you go ahead and decide on that one. But, again, he can't taking the ball to the basket is still an adventure for him. And the fact that, you know, he would not be the go-to guy in, a, in last minutes of a game I mean, he's just someone you play off of. You have a situation where Rajon Rondo at times were played off of, and teams pay the price. I don't see him coming in the clutch as of this point in his career like you, Rajon Rondo has. So, I'm yeah, not sure. Rondo's worked on it for years. Like, I, I think that I think that's what I think. Ball has a similar career trajectory of either like a Rondo or a Tony Allen, so. right? Like, I hope I mean, so because I mean, it's a championship in his future. I, I, he's got those. He's got skills, man. He's he's got those skills, and he's got a feel for the game. That you know, I think the whole ball family has a pretty. Maybe not the middle brother. The middle brother's kind of the the ugly ducking duckling of the basketball world. But uh, I don't see him as having a, a, an NBA career. To be honest, he might he might do well on a G League team. You know, get some time on a G League team. Uh, you know, have an NBA game here or there. Just out of you know the uh, Andre Robers, Roberson effect. Uh, but I think that. It, Lonzo could definitely be like, you know, he, he's like Caruso, but with so much more height. That's the problem. It's, it's, if he had come in to the league like Caruso did and like kind of toiled away in the shadows and suddenly dunked on somebody and then everybody was like, oh, who's this guy? I think he would have had a very different career story, but he came in with like such a spotlight, such a huge level of expectations placed on him by Magic Johnson who picked him. And like, promptly like dumped a whole load of gas on top of him through a match and walked away went well you figure it out but you're gonna be the future like what like what and now his (laughs) and now his brother comes in as a potential number one draft choice and that's something that obviously is a lot of pressure to go without the you know to go with uh, on that he's getting the same level of bias and uh negativity just because of his father that lonzo got well we'll see what happens with that but i want to go ahead and and ask Sean real quick because he's been very patient again. Thank you, Sean, for your patience. Your thoughts on Lonzo Ball. Would you like to see him coming back to Lakers? And do you think he can be an integral piece? Because, again, I think his off-the-ball defense is outstanding. Even at L.A., I saw issues where he, people would go ahead and get those steals and get those things to run up the break, obviously make the pass. He's got great vision. But there are certain facets of his game that even Rajon Rondo – like you said, it has a little bit more on. Hopefully he'll develop those things as far as going to the basket, maybe developing a consistent three-pointer, but I just don't see him as a complete guard that the Lakers should be interested in getting at this point. Yeah, I don't think so either, Gerald. And I agree. I don't think he's necessarily finished as a player. I don't think that cake is baked yet. I think there's some potential there. Um I don't think his defense was as pronouncedly as bad as people made it out to be when we drafted him. I've seen uh, a guy giving a lot of effort on that end, but you're right. He struggles in isolation with guards that can dribble drive or, you know, are just stronger than he is. No, I don't think he'll be back. Uh, I mean, you can always come home again. I just don't think the time is right now. And I don't think he's what we need on the perimeter right now. I agree with you. I, I think we have other pressing needs. I think we do as well. But, again, that's something just Laker Tom wanted to throw out there. I noticed that on the conversations this week. But we want to hear from you out there. Do you think that Lonzo Ball would be great coming back to Lakers and would be a good fit for the team at this point in time? Again, I don't think that – they would uh, at New Orleans is going to do anything as far as with the Lakers. I think they're pretty much done with the Lakers for at least a year or two. I don't see Drew Holiday being the the, the guy that they're going to trade over because again, they just got finished with the AD trade. I don't think they want any more pieces from the Lakers organization at this point in time. But we'll see. We'll see what happens. It's going to be something to think about. 
We'll be back with more of the Lakers Fast Break Podcast. Hey, Lakers fans. Looking for the best place to go for up-to-date news, information, original videos, articles, podcasts, opinion pieces, and discussions about the world champion, Los Angeles Lakers? Well, look no further than Lakerholics.com. With a legion of followers always there talking about everything Lakers and the NBA, there's no better place to go to share your fandom as the team heads toward another championship run. So stop by and be part of the conversation today at Lakerholics.com. Before we head on out, Laker Tom, I want to go ahead and give you the floor once again. Are there any more Laker targets that you're looking strongly at? Because some of them actually, when you mention on Lakerholics.com, are pretty darn good. Well, I think that the Lakers are clearly looking to trade. I think that it's complicated a little bit by the shortened uh, off season. That's less time, but uh, but I also think that they also realize that there are a lot of big names out there. I mean, Giannis has been talked about in a trade. Um, we've got uh, Booker being talked about in a trade, uh, wanting to get out of uh, out of uh, out of uh, Phoenix. You got a lot of players out there. Um, I love Miles Turner. I think Miles Turner and and Christian Wood are two guys who are definitely uh, targets that the Lakers should have some interest in. And I think that there's still a lot of validity to Chris Paul being in there. He's not my top choice, but you basically very often don't get your top choice. Uh, a lot of times, there's so many different good players out there being talked about being traded, even Bradley Beal. And I think that just like we saw last year, there's going to be a lot of movement. I think it's going to be a surprise that there's going to be a lot more big names moved around and big trades made and several sign in trades. It's going to remind me a lot of last year in the amount of activity that we see. And part of that is going to be fueled by the simple economic realities that a lot of teams are going to be looking at two very horrible seasons and they don't have the revenue. They're relying upon the appreciation value of their franchise uh, as to how they make their money, not running the operation. The Lakers and, and the Knicks and a few other teams that have big TV contracts are going to have an advantage. And they're profitable teams. I think there's also some tax advantages that they're going to get during this period. So I, I see the whole trade situation as being kind of a musical chairs. There's a lot of players going around and a lot of teams are going to be making offers and players are going to be grabbing this chair and grabbing that chair and grabbing that chair. And there's going to be a couple of teams who are going to be sitting there and a couple of players are going to be sitting there wondering, well, where am I going to go? I think you may see a lot of one-year deals as people line up to try to you know, be set for 21-22 when there'll be a lot of free agency, when hopefully teams will be looking at, at uh, the entire league being back and, and fans being in the arenas and so forth. So I think there's a lot of things happening. And, and when stuff keeps moving like that, there could be two or three guys out there who teams want to move and there might only be one or two seats left on teams that are willing to pay for it at this point in time. And so I think when you look at all of these trades, you can make proposals of whether this is a good offer or that's a good offer. But you take you take the there's a hierarchy also of the players in there. Drew Holiday's 30 years old. He's not going to get as many offers as as Giannis is going to get or or some other players. Um, you got guys with injury situations like Gordon Hayward uh, and Oladipo both who that that's going to affect them. Oladipo is going to become a free agent, so nobody wants a rental. But there's a lot of factors that go in there. And we may well see that the Lakers, basically the Lakers have got trade assets. I'm just saying when you compare apples to apples to, let's say, for the same player per se, there are teams out there that might have better apples. I'm, that's all well, I'm saying. Also, the better offer is not always what wins. A lot of these deals come from relationships. Yeah, but There's again. A lot of trades that never hit everybody's desk and never everybody doesn't get a chance to bid on. I I'm not there's sure. A though possibility, that... There's a possibility. I understand that that there's some animosity between New Orleans and having to give up AD. But the other side of that, there's also a relationship that we have between David Griffin and Rob Palenka, where I could easily see that they might talk to each other when maybe he wouldn't talk to whoever the general manager is of of the Hornets or of the 76ers because maybe he's never run and made a deal with them. 
Do I think they're going to get Drew Holiday or be in the running for Drew Holiday? I don't think so. Simply because of the fact that I don't think that the New Orleans is going to be interested in you know being another Lakers East like Washington is. JJ Redick, if there's any going to be Rondo, man, just like Rondo. Rondo, I did change my mind. Yeah, eventually, you're right. Yeah, right. but then if he signs more for the Clippers, if, you know, maybe he'll be like a mole that self destructs the Clippers right there for you. Maybe that ought to be something. But I know Jamie, a double agent. Yes, double agent per se. But Sean, I know you had some words you wanted to go ahead and say. So I apologize for keeping you waiting. Go ahead. I wanted to piggyback of something Tom had said about kind of the chess moves falling one at a time. If the, the two names that have been associated with Denver as far as trades over the past 18 months are Drew Holiday and Zach Levine. If they trade for Drew, that immediately takes them out of the running to try and acquire Zach Levine because they would have money tied up with Drew, with Joker, and with Jamal. But I meant, and I mentioned this off. last week as far as Zach Levine be a viable trade target. I thought that's an actually something, if he's healthy, would be a great way to go. Absolutely, because at this he's point be, in time... He's going to cost more than Lakers, Drew Holiday is. I'm not touching that one. Go ahead, Sean. Yeah, no, I was, I was going to say, if Drew does go to Denver then the Lakers do have a much more attractive offer to a team like Chicago than other teams. For example, the Lakers offering Caruso and a first plus Kuzma and plus Danny Green is a much more attractive offer than someone like Dallas offering Tim Hardaway Jr. and a first. Well, I know if that's the case. As far as that's concerned. I would offer, if that's the case and you're offering that package, I would ask for Lowry Markinen. Added on to it as well. Yeah, so. exactly. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. I, you know, kind of like an Ariza deal. Like you're acquiring somebody you think may have a better chance in a better situation. So that, I think, like I said, I, I, that's just my deal. I, you know, thank you, Sean, for saying that. Jamie, Mr. Birthday Boy, what do you think, my friend? I, that's, I know you're muted right now, but you want to go ahead and share your thoughts on it. It's, it's just opinionated. So, okay. I don't believe it. <laughs> Uh, so a couple of things. One, I think that uh, the timing of everything is exactly the crucial part because once we sign AD to whatever we sign AD to, that's capping us out. Uh, so any player that you need to sign into your cap space has to be signed before we sign AD. After that, you can only use the exceptions, uh, and those are for pretty much a fixed amount. And if you don't, if you use those and go over the fixed amount, then you're going to hard cap yourself, which makes the rest of the year difficult, especially when you get it. I don't think any team wants to be hard capped this year, specifically because of COVID-19, specifically because you're going to want to be able to add players at any moment, at any time, because two or three of them could go down potentially for the season, potentially for the season. You don't, we don't know. You know, obviously the medical doctor below me has a different opinion, but that's just, I don't, I don't see, I don't see a way that we can add some of these we can add some of these players at what i consider to be a too great cost i don't think if you get a zach Levine, you're exponentially improving the team for the players you're shipping out i can't tell you the number of times that we all sat around and talked about danny green's impact despite the eye test that he had in the nba finals we all talked about how he had some of the best net rating stats on the team we all talked about like how kuz was taking steps forward and so some of these cost control guys i also think it's important to keep it going forward because it gives you options that you're not going to have with somebody necessarily that you get back in a trade and because next year is going to be such a it's going to be a loss year for the entire nba it will be a financial loss year no matter how you cut it no matter what good bonus things come out of it that will just mean it's a slightly less of a loss year and i can, i don't care if you're a family-run franchise like the lakers or like or you're owned by a conglomerate nobody likes losses nobody's like well that, that wasn't so bad we only lost Four hundred and fifty million dollars, and not six hundred and twenty. You know that never make, and I, and I would never treat somebody else's money uh, like that. You know that's not my money. So if they choose to do that, then that's something that they chose to do. But I don't think that is not what I would do. So to that, uh, I again of all the players that we've talked about, literally Drew Holiday is the only one I could see making that run for because of his age, because of his chemistry with Anthony Davis, because he plays well off the ball, which allows LeBron to be LeBron and AD to be AD. Uh, and 
those are basically the reasons. And he's a good defender. That's the other thing. You can't bring in somebody like Levine who's a bad defender and expect him to do well in a Frank Vogel system. Like it's just it's it's just not going to happen. And it's one of the reasons why I think, you know, when we talked about Lonzo Ball earlier, Lonzo Ball's qualifying offer for next year is $14 million. Like Lonzo Ball is not worth $14 million. He's not going to be worth $14 million this year. He may never be worth $14 million again. If he does, then good job, Lonzo Ball. You've improved your game, and you know you've left an impact on the league. And good job. But we don't need to trade for a player who's going to cost us fourteen million dollars to resign next year, uh, or we have to renounce. And none of that makes sense to me. So it's kind of the same with Oladipo. Wait to see what he can do, Lonzo Ball. Wait to see what he can do. If 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 New Orleans wants to sign him to a fourteen million dollar qualifying offer contract. Oh yeah, great job. Because Lonzo well, Ball looked really, well really, <laughs> yeah. really bad. He looked awful in the bubble. I don't think he's. I don't think he's really, really. I mean, in the bubble, I, that's the Lakers looked really bad at first in the bubble, and, and that, I, I, I think that that's a bad. That, his sixty games is what I'm. His his pre bubble games, the fifty two, fifty three, whatever it was. Uh, I, I, I thought that he really did show a lot of improvement. I think that he has to work on his free throws. I think that he needs to. That's. If he fixes that, it gets rid of his hesitancy to drive to the in the paint. It means he'll be able to probe more as a point guard. I mean, and, and or he has to decide to be like Rondo and just not care, right? Like Rondo ball, Rondo is not a great free throw shooter, but he doesn't care. He doesn't let it stop him. He doesn't. None of Rondo's deficiencies ever stop Rondo. That's why I have always loved Rajon Rondo. Like, uh, there's a million things you could point that are holes in Rajon Rondo's game. But he doesn't care. <laughs> he doesn't let it stop him. He doesn't listen to you. You know, by that I mean the royal you. Yeah. Uh, you know, so that's that's where I feel Lonzo Ball has a, a different. He just has a different mentality. He's like too much of a cool dude about everything. And I kind of felt the same about Brandon Ingram when he was here. And I think one of the reasons they've done well on a small market team is because it's just a lot less expectation. Um, which is the irony about not performing well in the bubble where there were no fans and almost no expectations except for waking up and go and play basketball. So, you know, it's it's it's, it's a weird world we're in. Uh, next year is going to be a weird season. It's going to be a weirder season this year from start to finish. And I honestly think in some ways this season is difficult to predict what's going to happen as it was in the bubble. You know, there's no... There's there's no blueprint for what we're going. Like when you said like let's map out how the season's going to go. I'm like, well, I don't. I mean, how many days are we going to put? Are we going to have like back to back to backs in Denver? Like to play three games and three nights in Denver and like LeBron rests the middle game and AD rests one of the. Because I could easily see a world like that. So like to see what the schedule is, I think is kind of going to be the determiner of the of the first question. That just to bring it back. To, then, you know, we try. Absolutely. We try. But I, uh, it's going to be interesting. I'm, I'm curious. I would love to see the schedule. I'm curious to see like what the roster options are for the season. Those are some of the things I'm looking at writing a, a five things about as we go forward to, to segue into that part of the show, I guess. Absolutely. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, you know, it's going to be interesting to see how this all actually shakes out. The fact that there's a loose tentative agreement to like, yes, we're moving forward, I think is the most important thing and a very positive thing. And let's all hope for the incremental forward progress on, on all fronts in life. Couldn't have said it better myself. It was the birthday boy talking there, Mr. Jamie Sweet, the guy that we're roasting, although I felt roasted pretty much most of this episode. But <laughs> Laker Tom, I know you're working on a lot of great articles. You mentioned two already. And again, I'm sorry for getting you upset. So I want to say that on, on the air. because I, uh, I just want to go ahead and finish it on this note. You know, we had a great weekend. Uh, a lot of great things were announced this weekend. So uh, Truly blessed uh, for everyone out there to hopefully we're heading in the right direction. Go ahead, Sean, real quick. All right. Yeah, no, just just coming up quick, chewing on something to work on, Gerald. You know, there are two different ways to build out uh, a championship team. You start with the superstar and you build out from there. Or you find core pieces and then find the superstar that fits within that mold. We found a deep we need to address the team moving forward to find that other piece to put beside him. So we're looking at, I think, a Devin Booker, personally. I think if you put Devin Booker beside Anthony Davis, Book was the best. Was I'm not disagreeing with you, the- but it's not just like you're going to go to Phoenix and say, hey, I want to go ahead and you know get Devin Booker. You know, after they stop yeah, laughing no, 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 at no, you no, for 10 minutes, you know. Come on. If you're running Phoenix, you're not going to give Dev, Devin Booker unless Devin Booker tells you, which, again, I know the rumors are out there, and, and it was on at Laker Tom on Twitter. So we'll see what happens. But my gosh, man, you're, well, you know, no. you're running Phoenix. Denver, you know, Devin Booker, you're going to try and keep it all costs. 
I'm just saying he is the guy you would slot beside Anthony Davis. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, in a dream scenario, but then we all wake up. Uh, but then again, it's the Lakers, so anything can happen. I mean, you know, th- tomorrow one of these star players can say, I want to go to the Lakers. I mean, it happened last year with, with AD, so I'm not going to put anything past it. But again, it's the Lakers Fast Break. If you want to go ahead and get a hold of us, Lakers Fast Break at Yahoo.com. I've gotten it from fans in the audience out there. I've gotten it through text, and I've gotten it from Laker Tom. My gosh, I'm getting it from all sides. I feel like I need Kevlar on. Again, Lakerholics.com. Look for Laker Tom on Medium at Medium.com for his great articles. Laker Tom on Twitter and Laker Tom everywhere you can at Lakerholics.com. Sean Grice, AK Magic Man, look for his great articles as well. And Jamie Sweet, the birthday boy. On a good note, we want to leave this conversation, and that is a happy, happy birthday to you, my friend. I hope it is a great one. I hope laughing at us for the past hour has been a great birthday present to you. Hopefully me getting, I, why do I feel like I'm the one that got roasted? <laughs> yeah, exactly. So I'll tell you what, it's been a great episode. Nonetheless, I want to go ahead and say, please, everyone stay safe, stay blessed out there. We're looking forward to more great shows coming up for the Lakers fast break. I've got a retrospective part one coming up this week and more great interviews leading up to the NBA draft, free agency, and so much more. We'll be here next week, hopefully to talk once again about the Lakers, but we'll see what happens coming up next week right here at the Lakers fast break podcast. <laughs>